Okay, good morning. My name is Carrie Friday, and I'm a senior at the Lawrenceville High School. And this past summer, I worked in the lab of malaria immunology and vaccinology at the National Institutes of Health under the mentorship of Dr. Patrick Duffy and Holly Toronto. The title of my project for this summer is Generation of DNA Vaccines for Gene Gun Immunizations of Mice with Novel Erythrocytic Vaccine Candidates. The goal of the Lab of Malaria Immunology and Vaccinology is to develop an effective vaccine against malaria. Currently, over 3.4 billion people live in malaria endemic areas, and these areas we are highlighted in red show where malaria is most prevalent. In 2013 alone, there were an estimated 198 million cases of malaria, and of those cases, 500,000 resulted in deaths. Although there are drugs readily available for people to try and prevent malaria, in a lot of the places where malaria is very prevalent, people are unable to afford these drugs because they have to be um, taken in continually and may also not have access to them as well. So that's why it's essential that we come up with a vaccine where somebody can take just one or two administrations of the, that vaccine and be able to prevent getting clinical malaria. Malaria is transmitted to humans when the female um, mosquito containing the malaria parasite feeds on the human and then the and then the malaria parasite, which is in the stage called the sporozoites, infect liver cells. Once the liver cells are infected, the sporozoites undergo my, my um, replication. After they replicate in the liver cells, then they develop into merozoites and cause the liver cells to rupture. During this stage, it's considered the pre-rephrocytic stage or the pre-blood cell stage of malaria. The goal of the, um, lab of, the goal of our lab right now is to currently to create a pre-rhythmic vaccine against malaria. This is because during the pre-rhythmic stage, somebody is still infected with the malaria parasite, however, they don't show any clinical signs of malaria. The clinical symptoms only come once the malaria parasite has developed into merozoids and infect the blood cell. It's also important that by creating a vaccine during the pre-rhythmic stage, even if it's only partially effective, it'll still ultimately help decrease the initial sporozoite count and then ultimately decrease the frequency and severity of the clinical malaria. There is a current vaccine candidate called RTSS that was recently approved by the EMA this past summer. This, is, this vaccine has efficacy rates of 46% in uh, young children under the age of five years and 27% efficacy in, children, in young infants aged under five months. These efficacy rates are promising for it as a first malaria vaccine because this is actually also the first vaccine ever made readily available against a parasite. However, compared to most other vaccines, efficacy rates tend to be closer to 80%. So although this vaccine is available, we still want to work towards creating a vaccine with higher efficacy rates and available for more widespread usage. In the stu studies that we're completing, we're using Plasmodium ulei circumsporozoic protein as our positive control. This is because the RTSS um, uses circumsporozoic protein as the antigenic target in, um, when the vaccine is being given, administered to humans. And plasmodium ulei, it, because malaria, sorry, excuse me, plasmodium is a part of, malaria parasites are a part of the plasmodium genus. And plasmodium ulei is the specific species that infects mice. Plasmodium falciparum is one of the most common and prevalent types and infects humans. The PYCSP is most similar to the RTSS vaccine, which is why we're going to be using that as the positive control in the next. The overarching goals of our pre vaccine antigen project is to establish a new model of protection and a new model of immunization using a genetically diverse mouse strain to obtain determined mechanisms of protective immunity conferred by PIVA immunogens to, specific, um, to optimize the vaccine design. We'd also like to assess optimized PIVA antigens, PIVA immunogens, and immunogen combinations for protective efficacy in the new mouse model. The PIVA project has been ongoing for multiple years, and, during, and due to my only being in the lab for eight weeks this past summer, my specific goal was to perform giga, multiple gigapress in order to collect the DNA for the PIVA project animal studies. So in order, currently, there are a lot of different um, antigens that will need to be tested, and for each study, you need a minimum of 180 micrograms of DNA. 
This is a list of the antigens that we tested in the lab. Uh, the PCI and PCIS just represent two different, uh, two different um, vectors that we use, the difference between the PCI and the PCIS being bad. The PCIS contains TPA, or a tissue plasminogen activator. This is in the hopes of increasing signaling. The EV stands for the empty vectors, which we used as our negative controls, and again, the PYCSP is what we used as the positive control. You might notice that, for example, we only have PYCSP in the PCI vector and not in the PCIS vector, but this is because this list of antigens are just the ones I worked on helping generate the DNA for specifically, as we currently have enough PCIS, PYCSP for the next upcoming studies. The methodology of what I worked on specifically in the lab was to first inoculate starter cultures, then to inoculate one liter of LB broth with 2.5 milliliters of that starter culture. Afterwards, the GigaPrep protocol was followed in order to purify the DNA, as it was grown in E. coli cultures, and since we're giving these immunizations to mice, we don't want to immunize them with E. coli, we just want to give them the DNA. Afterwards, the DNA concentration was measured in order to confirm that we had more than 180 micrograms, which is what was necessary for each study. The final step was to submit the DNA for quality <coughs> control checks in order to make sure that we are consistent with the quality of the DNA from previous studies. Uh, this table shows all of the concentration of the PIVA DNA that we generated, and you can see that the total DNA gathered is more than 180 micrograms for each of the constructs. One of the first quality control checks that we performed were endotoxin testing. And these are examples of some of the test strips that we would use for endotoxin testing. The most important values are that we have less than 100 endotoxin units per ml for each of the DNA uh, samples that we looked at. And this is, again, just to be consistent with previous studies and that we've always had less than 100 endotoxin units. The next quality control check that we performed were enzyme digests, and this was to make sure that we would have no mix-up of the different antigens that we're testing. But, and so you can see that, um, for example, the PCIS-1995C and the pcis SNP will have different cut sites, um, with, even with the same enzymes, just to make sure that we can confirm that they're different. Because going on in the animal studies, if, say, the pcis SNP is actually a um, very effective and valid vaccine candidate and the PCIS 1995C is not, you want to be able to look back to this original generation of the DNA to confirm that what we were actually giving the mice is in fact, say, the PCIS Schmidt. So that was the end of the research that I worked on specifically this summer, but I also just want to provide you with some information about what's going on in the future in the lab. The way the vaccines are administered is via the gene gun. The Helios gene gun is a biosig particle delivery system. There are one micrometer bulk particles coated with 2.5 micrograms of DNA for each cartridge. The rodents are immunized here. This would be the tip of the gene gun. And there's pressurized air is fired. And then the antigens are going to dissolve intradermally. And then we're hoping that will allow them to initiate an immune response in the mice. The gene gun immunization schedule begins with two DNA Two, two DNA immunizations. One occurs on day zero, and then one occurs 21 days after that initial immunization. Following the DNA immunizations, there is an adenovirus boost given to the mice. This is in the hopes of increasing the T cell response. Afterwards, four of the mice used for each study will be sacrificed, and their spleens will be harvested for ELISA analysis. Then the remaining mice will be challenged seven days following that harvest with the plasmodium uelii. The goal of this is to achieve sterile protection. Okay. So in conclusion, the Giga prep of each sample tested was successfully performed. The DNA had sufficient yield, which was greater than 180 micrograms for the animal study pro protocol and passed all of the quality checks. Currently, the PCI empty vector, PCIS um, PY Schmidt, and PCIS PY 1995C are being evaluated in an animal model. In the future, we'd like to increase the effectiveness of the vaccine by potentially combining multiple antigens. So for example, we know that the PYCSP is able to get um, some form of immunity, and maybe by combining it with one of the other antigens, that could actually help increase immune response. However, because the mechanism of protection for against malaria is still not very well understood, it could be possible that by combining the different antigens, 
that actually end up diminishing their immune response. We'd also like to generate DNA for targeting malaria at different stages, as well as continued antigen discovery efforts, as there might be, there might be more places on the plasmodium gene that will allow for more immunity. And then lastly, we'd also like to determine the mechanism of protection, because still very little is understood in regards to it. Thank you. This is my list of acknowledgments. Are there any questions or comments? So why do you pick hundred units of uh, endotoxin? Is that like a cutoff value, normal reference? Oh yeah, just um, looking at previous papers and research that others have done, we just want to be consistent with that. Okay, great. So what would you do if one of your preps had greater than hundred? Oh, so what we do is they're actually purification protocols. So for example, with one of them when we were um, working in the lab, it might start out and it reads over, like, say, 120. Then you go back and repurify the DNA, and it might decrease the concentration, but but still, most of the most important thing is to have less than 100 endotoxin units. Yeah. Other question? Yes. Do you know why using gene gun and not other other methods to increase uh, the transfection rate of the DNA vaccine? Yeah, just because again, like with the lab, they've been using gene gun studies for some time, and it's been shown to help really give us a better understanding of like how much. It's been shown that in previous studies that it helps elicit a very high response in mice. Mm -hmm. Because there are other transfections oh, yeah. to increase, like electroporation, mm -hmm. is, is known as one of the best. So maybe I have to find another one besides gene that will be a, a nice approach to compare. Oh, yeah. So that would be good to look at in the future. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you.